very much. I'm Rob Rogers, Jonathan Marvel, and thank you, Anne, Rosalie, and the league, and great turnout. Um, we just remarked that we took the slide count quite seriously, so we'll talk a lot on each slide. Um, we also took another look at, I guess we need to set up, is it the next one, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and we actually thought about threshold not as in uh, the place of a particular project or in a certain way, because it's, it's a word, it's a thought, and it's a term that we involve in our practice in many ways through many projects. And uh, in our own conversation about threshold, we decided to take on something that actually recurs in our work a lot, which is trying to uh, develop not just a, a spatial condition of threshold, but actually the, the time component, and then very specifically, uh, the threshold of sort of day and night that crosses every single project, and particularly those of an of a urban component. It's part of the city that sometimes you and, you and I and, and everybody else probably see the city as much at night as you do in the daytime. And to try and understand where a project lives in both of those spaces and both of those times uh, kind of recurs in, in very much of our work. So we selected out uh, a kind of a group of images and places and things to try and examine that really within our own practice. Um, and we're gonna show you a series of sites uh, that, are, that are based in New York, but we've also found that it's a, a condition that we explore in many ways. And this is uh, a project that we did in Aoyama in Tokyo for Kate Spade, where they flew us over there and showed us that they had purchased a Georgian house for their store, it was kind of shocking, um, and, and said, well, you know, what are we going to do this? And then we found out it's in a historic district called the Green Zone, where you can't actually monkey with it very much. And we said, well, what are we going to do? And, and maybe the, the most amazing thing is that this is this sort of uh, quiet shopping district in the daytime, and at nighttime, this is kind of incredible sort of street fills up with people all over, and it becomes another thing. And so we really felt the, the trick or the, the opportunity for the architecture before you got into the store was to recognize that transition of, of time and let the building almost have two completely components, the, the sort of ghost life of the Georgian building that exists inside this new skin of the store um, and featuring the, the prominent piece. And it's a, this kind of lesson of daytime, nighttime, uh, really began to evolve relatively early in our practice for the, like the project for the Studio Museum where we realized in early conversations with the client where every single storefront on 125th Street for five blocks in every direction is shuttered uh, at night and the street is very dark. It's improving now, but it was really no man's land and the decision to, to not gate the front, but actually turn it into a sort of light fixture of 125th, 125th Street, so that you know in the daytime, this really calm, quiet uh, glass elevation was in high contrast to Jimmy Jazz and the shoe stores and the, and the sort of bright retail elements that exist all around. And then at night, as the street closed down and becomes really dark, the, the museum comes and sort of holds its own as an institution and as a public place on the street. Um, and so here, a shot taken at five in the morning, you know, you can begin to see that, that transition time where it's crossing over from its luminous evening presence back into sort of the demure, quiet, uh, calm facade on 125th Street during the day. And we began to learn from this project too that if you're gonna uh, inject compelling and interesting lighting components, then you've got to engage them quickly with program or, or they'll be yanked out quickly, especially in public budgets. And so, in fact, here, the, the early use of the, of the reglet glass um, installed on a public project without an MEA number, but forget about that. The, you know, it was, it was still really cheap in those days, and, it, and we got it through by being able to use it that way. And the luminous tower is actually all of the air supply for the lower level galleries and basements, and then it's clad uh, very simply in translucent glass and above. And we really enjoy it that this project in itself became, you know, 
to the term threshold, not only a sort of gauge by day and night of the new presence and the new opportunity on 125th Street, but actually became the gathering place uh, that really is the, the home institution and the cultural institution to begin anchoring uh, change, changes up and down 125th Street. Um, we're just finishing uh, a project at Battery Park City uh, that was redoing the streetscapes in the north neighborhood. And although the project was initiated by a drive for security measures to protect the World Financial Center, it was also a chance to revision the North neighborhood, you know, 20 years after it was master planned, as it was beginning to be built out. And what uh, began as a series of sort of little uh, classical medians that marched down North End Avenue really had a chance to be reprogrammed. And in the context of developing a, a security line for the World Financial Center, which is the long, bright line, runs along Vesey Street, is actually a luminous bench, which becomes a pedestrian light that lights the way from the World Trade Center, which will be the site on your left, to the new ferry terminal on the water, which will be to the right. And that, in contrast to that low-level, low-lying glass pedestrian light, bench, amenity, security element, we had to recall the, the axis that had been developed along North End Avenue uh, from the master plan, but had sort of let these abandoned medians exist in between the new housing projects. And they were kind of curiously programmed. The one closest to Stuyvesant High is where all the kids smoke. You know, the one in the middle is where, you know, people kind of can hide out in the trees and you're not sure exactly what they're doing. And, you know, back between the buildings of the World Financial Center that had actually been taken over by all the security guys that were checking trucks. So the, the sort of, you know, loss of public space to these uh, changing program elements we wanted to incorporate. And so we reprogrammed the medians and we uh, furnished each one of them with a shade structure and luminaire. Uh, it, was, it was really interesting. We actually got it initially through Battery Park City because we uh, programmed one of the medians with a dog run. And in the formal agreement with the community board and the dog owners, uh, they had agreed that a shade structure must be included in the program, which I think everybody was expecting to be some kind of wood trellis thing like the other stuff. Uh, and in fact, what we were able to do is, working with Jamie Carpenter, uh, develop a really thin light glass and steel shade structure that also is uplit at night so that it bounces all of the ground light down at the street walk crossings and gives us a sort of uh, this daytime, nighttime occupancy and presence of those uh, pieces up and down the boulevard. And then also with Jamie working on that cast glass bench, which is the pedestrian light, it is the bench, and it is in fact the, part of the security perimeter around the World Financial Center, playing off uh, the work of uh, Brian Toll and 1100 at, at the Hunger Memorial, and sort of continuing the next horizontal band of light uh, that exists up and down along Vesey Street. And then uh, a project probably familiar to many of you, but uh, when we took on and did the competition, the 55 Water with uh, Ken Smith, uh, it was really amazing. The first time we visited the site, it was 12.30 in the afternoon, and the building was completely, I mean, the, the, the public space was totally in shadow from the enormous building that surrounds it. It's kind of like you make a public space, it's a pop space, Right, so you get a huge zoning bonus, and when you use that zoning bonus to make sure that the space is in shade forever. So we, we thought that it's not only a public space problem, but in fact it's a, it's a lighting problem, because it, the building really did not get direct sun and direct light. And the uh, sequence was to, A, get you up 30 feet, so redo the entrance, which is to the left, the series of escalators and stairs that take you up and then to the park that rises up and out to the boardwalk that looks over and out to the East River, and to cue you immediately, both day and night, that this is the entry point, that you're welcome here. It's a public space. It's no longer sort of dark and bleak, but actually a bit of a, an adventure and a discovery to, to walk up through these luminous elements up and into the park where the beacon actually 
does not provide the light for, par for the park, but it does psychologically, almost like a floor lamp in your living room. It, it feels like that's where the light's coming from, even though we're actually delivering it from many stories above with, with lights down. And so it's, it's got this kind of scale of occupiable space, and the light gives you a level of, of comfort even in those median hours. And then it, of course, recalls the, the lighting elements of the entry. So as you begin <coughs> to engage the, the urban uh, activity of passing around and knowing, you begin to associate that entry with the beacon itself. So the park has a place and a place of discovery uh, in your experience downtown. A little in background information on, on a lot of the, the, the projects that we try to grapple with on a on a day to day basis, that to infuse them with something that's architecturally important to us, when in fact maybe there's no there's not a real budget to work with, or you have to often as an architect invent the program or invent something to make it exciting for you because the client just wants a simple whatever. Um, we often just go back to that kind of age old uh, idea that with with the, if you can solve the way people move through the space and if you can solve the way you illuminate the space or the building, um, thusly if you can solve the, the circulation and the lighting of the project, you almost got a project to, to work with that, that's meaningful to you as an architect. And, and I think when we, when we really look at our work in a very simple conceptual way, looking at the circulation, looking at the lighting is, is, gives us a sense of uh, joy and, and satisfaction, even if there's the end result is, may not even be so. Um, so it's a self-fulfilling sort of thing. So in in this simple section of 55 Water Street, um, you know the the idea of moving through the project from the street level up to that 30 foot high boardwalk, um, and and having a recurring kind of light theme going from the street to to the to the view of the city. Uh, going from a kind of outdoor condition to an indoor outdoor condition um, is is important and and really informs a lot of of our work. This is a uh, project that is in the kind of schematic design phase, but it it has uh, taken on, on a, a full blown design element because we had to get it past the Landmark Preservation Commission. It's the Battery Maritime Building on the tip of Manhattan. It's a wonderful old 1908 building, the original ferry terminal uh, that sent out ferries throughout the New York Harbor, um, was quickly put out of use by the subway system that, that took over our, our mass transit uh, element. So here, in kind of going from one section at 55 Water to the section in the Battery Maritime Building, you can see the new element that, that is sort of that the lamp that the moths are flying to is up hovering on top of the, the section of the old historic structure, which is um, with, you know, adorned with these wonderful uh, outdoor rooms. You can see the loggia facing South Street on your right, on the second floor, moving into the Great Hall with a big skylight, uh, with wonderful rooms looking out onto the New York Harbor at that same second floor level, which is where the ferries, um, you get on the ferry from that second floor and get off the ferry from that second floor, so it becomes the big public room. Uh, our project is sitting on top of that on the water side, um, so you, our, our, our circulation scheme is actually moving people through the historic and up to the new, and from the new you'll get this dramatic view of the New York Harbor. So here's the view of the historic facade on South Street uh, with the exterior loggia and um, hovering in the background on the water side would be the, uh, the new program that we're um, really engaging the historic structure with a, a hotel and all of its uh, components, the rooms, the outdoor spaces, its restaurant and bar, and that, um, that addition overlooking the New York Harbor is something that is, uh, you know, on that, the city's edge, it is, it engages the, both the historic and the new, and um, in that daytime, nighttime condition, uh, actively comes alive uh, in, 
and, and becomes the uh, real destination point because you do have to cross that kind of the moat that FDR Drive presents to, to all of us as we try to engage the waterfront on the East River. And moving through, the, in terms of a interior circulation, the threshold of the ground floor to the second floor, giving you, uh, a, as a teaser, some of the, the illuminated objects that, will, that you'll be uh, given to as dessert as you end up on the top floor overlooking the harbor. You go from that ground floor to the second floor, um, great room which, which will be restored in, in many ways up to a certain level and then uh, given a new clearer story uh, up, on, up on the ceiling so we can get both natural light through a, a new kind of illuminated effort. In contrast to the historic and at nighttime that, that becomes the, the glowing lantern and then the, the final arrival up in the, the, what will be the seventh floor of the building overlooking the, the East River and, and views from Brooklyn Bridge down to Governor's Island, uh, this great outdoor public space um, that, that hopefully we'll, we'll all go and have martinis there in a couple of years. Um, the, sort of the, the, and the end of this sequence of projects, as we, we want to end up with a, with a sort of more internal condition, and this is a, um, one of those public, uh, publicly operated private spaces, um, privately operated public spaces. It's the connection on uh, the Metropolitan Tower, which is a building that straddles a, a full block between 57th Street on, your, on the top and 56th Street down below. The, it's the lobby to the, to the commercial portion of this building um, which is one of the, you know, it's that black angular building and, and we were asked by the, the new owner of the building to, to create a lobby that would be both exciting for the, the visitor that's just walking through from one block to the other uh, during the rain, taking that shortcut, or for the commercial tenants um, to feel like they're, you know, the building has new life and new meaning to them. So we start out with a canopy on 57th Street that provocatively draws you into the into the, the commercial lobby of the building. And um, in, 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 in a contextual move, we, we created a black glass um, and black painted metal uh, series of walls that, that pull you through from one end of the, of the lobby to the other um, in this sort of seamless transition so that you can zip right along through there with the only interruption in in this effort uh, will be the, the, the information desk and, and security desk that then acts as the threshold into the private spaces up above. And along your way there, um, on your left, on the left of this slide, it's, you can't really see it, but there's a, a, a strip of, of LEDs that run along at a five foot high level from 56th Street all the way to 57th Street and that um, will be a stream of information programmed by an artist, programmed by a newscaster, whatever the mood the building wants to evoke at the time. And as you go through there, um, zipping along the, the uh, information desk starts to change color on you. Um, and so you, you don't really understand, you know, are you in the same place? Everything else is just sort of, you know, this really simple palette of granite on the floor and a, a plastered ceiling um, with this black metal panel surrounding you, um, really, the, that, and that little L LED, LCD information strip, you can see it now in elevation, um, running in a stream of, of, of wonderful, uh, you know, entertaining moments. And then the moment of pause becomes that mid-zone, which is a uh, translucent glass that with the L LEDs that are constantly on some kind of mood lava lamp type of, of uh, uh, kind of moment. And here, you know, the reflections of the metal and the uh, giving you a contrast, uh, that kind of reduction and, and, and minimalism of materiality can, can create a, a very mysterious and yet sort of compositional opportunity. And then this is that, that sort of deeply symmetrical moment of pause as you engage finally the, the moment of, 
of interaction with the upper floors of the building and the, uh, the, the crusty base there to, to receive you and, and, uh, and, and allow you to, to, to go on up. And, and then you, you know, go into the elevators. And um, so this, this kind of play of, of light and, 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 and movement sort of coming together uh, in this, this final compositional moment, sort of, again, architects doing what we like to do, sort of trying to hide our story inside of the project. Um, and and yet satisfying the needs of the client is is always the the lesson in the end. And so when we present to this to to our peers and our professional um, friends and colleagues, you know, this is ultimately, I think, what we're all trying to to seek and in, in that moment of satisfaction. Thank you.